What is up, everybody? Welcome to what is probably my most requested video ever. Can you beat Persona 4 using only Izanagi? Just to refresh your memory, in Persona 4, Izanagi is your starting Persona. Because of this, he's purposefully designed to be as weak as possible and only useful for the very beginning of the game, because the developers want you to fuse him off for a better Persona once you reach higher level. But, is it possible to beat the game using only your default Persona in Persona 4? I already did a similar challenge with Orpheus in Persona 3 Portable, which is why this video was so requested. And to tell you the truth, I actually did want to do it earlier, but couldn't because the only version that this challenge can realistically be completed in is Golden, which is exclusive to the PS Vita. And there's no way to emulate it, so the only way to record footage of it is with a PS TV. However, the PS TV has HD copy protection, so if you try hooking it up to a capture card, it just gives you a black screen. Well, it turns out there actually is a workaround. If you get an HDMI splitter, it will let you bypass the HD copy protection. So, if you want to record footage of Persona 4 Golden with your capture card, get an HDMI splitter and tell that HD copy protection to go f*** itself. At least that's what I would be telling you to do, but just a couple of weeks after I recorded all the footage of this video, Persona 4 Golden, out of nowhere, was released for PC. So, yeah, you could do what I just said, or you can just get the PC version and record with OBS. Unfortunately, when I started working on this video, I never in a million years would have thought that Persona 4 Golden would be coming to PC. So, all the footage you're about to see will be from the Vita version. I'm going to be honest with you guys, another one of the reasons this video took so long is because I was struggling to find the motivation to finish it, because now I'm working with an obsolete version. But then again, I guess that wouldn't be the first time that would happen. But now that that's out of the way, let's lay down our list of rules. Obviously, this is an Izanagi-only challenge, so I can only have Izanagi equipped for the entirety of the game. I cannot switch Personas at any time for any reason. Other than that, it's the same as the last one. No cheat codes, no new game plus, and I have to be playing on the highest difficulty. Now that that's out of the way, let's get started. After watching the opening, I get to the title screen, choose new game, choose very hard as the difficulty, and then get to the Velvet Room, where I am introduced to Igor along with his assistant, Margaret. I wake up on the train, get off to meet Dojima and Nanako, and then get another dream sequence with our first scripted battle. After that, we go to school and meet three of our main cast members, Chie, Yukiko, and Yosuke, where they tell us about the Midnight Channel, which is a secret channel where if you turn on your TV on a rainy night, you'll see your soulmate. So, being the naive teenager that we are, we decide to check it out, and we almost get sucked into the TV. So the next day, we go to Juness to try it with some bigger TVs, and the same thing happens. We wind up in the TV world, where we meet... Uh... So anyway, uh, who's actually named Teddy, shows us the way out. What's going on? The next morning, we wake up and find out that Yosuke's girlfriend has been found dead. So, we decide to go back to the TV world to investigate and get our first real battle. Now, I know with my editing, it doesn't seem like it's very long, but one of my biggest pet peeves with this game is how long the intro is. I mean, I've been playing for almost two hours, and not until now do I finally get a non-scripted fight. But yeah, these enemies are weak to electricity, which Izanagi specializes in, so it's no problem. We then get to the next area where we see Yosuke's shadow, and Yosuke denies it's him by saying, you're not me. <laughs> That's right! Say it again! You're not me! You're nothing like me! Yeah, get used to the character saying that. But anyway, he evolves into a boss, and now we gotta beat it. So, this boss is actually pretty easy as long as you know what you're doing. Just spam Zeo, guard when he does, and then heal when your health gets low. 
Unfortunately, I underestimate how much damage he can do the first time and he kills me, so I gotta watch the cutscenes again and do the tutorial battle again. But after this, I'm able to beat him with ease, and then Izanagi levels up. After Yosuke accepts the shadow, he gets his persona, and then we go back. Then the next day, we start the Magician Social Link with Yosuke. After that, we tune into the Midnight Channel to see our friend Yukiko on screen, and it turns out she's missing, so back to the TV world to find her. We get to her dungeon, and now we can actually start upgrading Izanagi. Now, I should also take this time to point out that Izanagi is, by default, a much better persona than Orpheus. Orpheus had two weaknesses and no resistance, however, Izanagi only has one weakness and is resistant to electricity while also being completely immune to darkness, so that's less weaknesses to worry about, but other than that, this challenge is pretty much going to be the same way. We'll have to upgrade Izanagi's stats while also updating his skill set by using skill cards. Now, even though we'll be doing a lot of the same stuff that we were doing in the Orpheus only run, the way we go about doing most of them is completely different. Pretty much everything from skill cards to stat increases in Persona 4 is done in shuffle time. If you remember this from Persona 3, you should know that it happens at the end of some battles, where cards are shuffled and then you get to choose one. These cards may contain a Persona, or an increase in money, or EXP, or heal you. However, in Golden, there are many more cards available. You can get cards that increase your Persona stats, give you skill cards, and in rare cases, level up your Persona or upgrade a skill. But not only that, in Golden, there are also some cards that have negative effects, but give you more draws. If you literally play your cards right and get all the cards, you get what's called a Sweet Bonus, which guarantees you'll be getting Shuffle Time at the end of the next battle, and it gives you two additional draws. This makes it really easy to get all the cards, and you can just keep getting Sweet Bonus after Sweet Bonus, and getting all the bonuses that are included. So... Yeah, I think it goes without saying, but we're going to be spending a lot of time in Shuffle Time. But anyway, we go through the first floor of the dungeon, and on the second one, we see Chie. And it's pretty much the same deal with Yosuke. She denies the shadow, so now we gotta fight it. So, this boss isn't particularly hard either, but with only two party members, it's kinda slow. So, the biggest issue with this boss is that it has Mazio, which is Yosuke's weakness. Sometimes the game will say she'll look scornfully at Yosuke, which means that she's gonna use Mazio the next turn, so whenever this happens, I have to defend with Yosuke, but sometimes she just goes ahead and uses Mazio without warning. She also has Green Wall, which makes her resistant to wind, which covers her weakness, and that makes things even slower. Basically, the strategy for this fight is to knock her down with Garu when Green Wall isn't active and then just defend and hit her with whatever we can while it is active. We also don't have many options for healing, so a lot of Yosuke's turns that he's not defending are spent using his Dia. But despite all this, this boss doesn't actually give us too much trouble. We're able to beat it on our first try. After that, Chie awakens, and with her, we form the investigation team, which starts the full social link. After that, we head out, and then start the chariot social link with Chie. Now, this is the point in the game where the game finally gives us free time and lets us do whatever we want. That is, provided there's anything to do, and here there's really not much to do other than go back into the TV to save Yukiko. Now, just like Persona 3, you can pretty much complete any dungeon in one run unless the game requires otherwise, so that's what I'm gonna try to be doing in pretty much every dungeon. Though, with my limited SP at this point in the game, I'm not so confident that I'll be able to do it. Once I'm back in the dungeon, things go okay, and I actually get a Tarunda skill card, which is great, until a shadow catches me off guard and kills me in one hit, making me lose all my progress. So, anyway, I go through the dungeon again, and I get the Patra, Mewtwo D, and Sukukaja skill cards, but then I decide to head back after the fifth floor because by this time I'm clean out of SP and healing items, and there's really nothing I can use at this point. I do go back the next day, and it's more of the same. I gotta fight a mini-boss, which isn't hard, but, you know, Tarundo would have been real helpful during this fight. But most of this part is just me running around from enemies that are too strong because I don't have anything that covers their weakness, which I kinda need so that I can get that guaranteed shuffle time. 
but eventually I do get to the end where Yukiko is, but again, I'm drained of SP and items, so I decide not to do it, but I do go back to the first floor to do some grinding, during which time I get the Agi, Sukunda, and Dia skill cards. Other than that, nothing really happens other than me just getting a whole bunch of stat bonuses and also a whole bunch of skill cards that I don't want. However, in addition to the skill and point cards, there are also cards that restore your HP and SP, so by doing this, I'm actually able to get back up to a pretty decent amount of SP. So, now that I have my SP back, I actually do decide to go and challenge Shadow Yukiko. Now, the thing about bosses in this game, as you may have already noticed from the fight against Shadow Chie, is that they're not really that hard, they're just special. Bungie, like they take forever to kill, and in most cases, they don't use their strongest moves until they're low on HP. Now, Yukiko's shadow specializes in fire attacks and is weak to Chie's Bufu, but she also has White Wall, which makes her resistant to ice, so really all you can do when this is up is just use physical moves. Her attacks aren't strong, and Chie also has Dodge Fire thanks to her accessory, but Midway through the fight, she'll start using Terror Voice, which makes a target fearful, and usually follows this up with Shivering Rondo, which can easily kill you in one hit. She also summons a minion called Charming Prince, which also casts fear and can heal her, which is pretty annoying. But her main attack is Burn to Ashes, a fire attack that hits everyone. Normally, she gives a warning before using it so you can guard, but close to the end, she doesn't and kills everyone in my party except for you. After that, I heal, and she uses Terror Voice and then Shivering Rondo, but at this point, Izanagi's endurance is so high that Yu just takes it like an absolute boss, and from there, I'm able to revive Chie and Yosuke, and then finish her off not long after. Once the fight is over, Yukiko accepts her shadow, awakens to her persona, and that concludes the first dungeon. After this, it's pretty much our free time to do whatever we want. One thing to keep in mind about Persona 4 is that it's not as lenient with free time as Persona 3. Social links are harder to rank up and may or may not be available depending on the weather. On rainy days, most people won't be available, so on those days, you're best off just working on your stats or grinding. Oh, and also one thing that's cool about Golden is that if you click on this little bubble, you can see what other people did, which is pretty cool, though I don't actually recommend doing what it says most of the time. At this point, I'm mostly just focusing on leveling up my social stats, almost all of which is done in your room. The only new social links I start during this period are the Aeon with Marie, the Justice with Nanako, and the Hermit with the Fox. The thing is, there's really not much I can do at this point. Unlike Iwatodai, where there was lots of stuff to do in the city, in Inaba, there's really not much to do other than just talk to NPCs. The boy's name is Shida. After Yukiko recovers, we find out that exams are coming up, so I decide to spend most of my time studying. Before long, we see Kanji on the Midnight Channel, and after staking him out, talking to a very feminine-looking boy, and starting Yukiko's social link, we see him again and confirm that he is indeed the next victim, so it's back to the TV world to save him. Now, once I get to Kanji's dungeon, I find out that I am extremely underleveled. Thankfully though, the enemies aren't that strong, and Chie's galactic punt definitely helps, along with twin dragons, but in most cases, it's not enough to kill them all in one turn. So, I grind till level 14, during which time I get really lucky and get the absolutely essential skill card for Apt Pupil. This makes normally difficult encounters much easier with critical hit knockdowns, and then after that, I get the Sonic Punch skill card so I can finally get rid of Cleave, and I also take every stat increase card I find. Now, the mid-boss is one of many strong physical tanky bosses. He uses Power Charge, Rebellion, and Taru Kaja, but he also has really low agility. After I use Secunda on him, he can't touch me, and I beat him without a whole lot of trouble. After this, I continue through the dungeon some more until I get low on MP, after which I go to Yukiko's castle to grind some more. Now, you may be wondering why I'm grinding in such a low-level area, and this is because despite me being super over-leveled in this area, the cards that I get from beating the enemies are the same, and the HP and MP restoring cards are based on a percentage, not a set value. 
So by beating enemies in a low level area, I can basically farm for unlimited MP and stat bonuses with minimal effort. During this time, I get the Tarun to skill card, and once I head back, I get the Dodge Win skill card, and then the Single Shot skill card, which is even better than Sonic Punch. Before long, I do make it to the end of Kanji's dungeon, but at this point, I'm basically burnt out with this dungeon, and I also want to upgrade items before I challenge the boss. So I go home, upgrade items, and then come back the next day. So, the way the fight against Shadow Kanji works is that he has two minions. The nice guy who is weak to fire, and the tough guy who is weak to ice. The tough guy uses just physical attacks, while the nice guy likes to use buffs and heal. So, I recommend going for the nice guy first. Now, the main body itself specializes in electric attacks and ailment attacks. Those two ailment attacks being Roar of Wrath, which enrages Chie and Yukiko, and Forbidden Murmur, which poisons you and Yosuke. He likes to spam these pretty much every turn, so unless you want to spend a crazy amount of money on ailment healing items, I don't think healing these ailments is worth it. You're better off just living with the poison and waiting for the rage to wear off. Like most bosses in this game, it's not that strong. The minions may give you some trouble, but once they're gone, this fight is a breeze. Now, the boss's trump card is Fanatical Spark, which is a strong electric move, but it's resisted by Izanagi, and Yosuke can't do that much damage anyway, so I recommend just defending with him. My strategy for this fight is to beat the minions first, debuff the main body, heal with Yukiko when necessary, and just keep repeating. He does take down a few of our party members, but not you, thankfully, because of his insanely high endurance. And overall, this fight is pretty easy. This boss goes down after about 20 minutes. After that, Kanji awakens, and the day is saved. And now, we just have to wait for him to recover, and we're pretty much free until then. During this period, I do start the Empress social link with Margaret and the Jester with Adachi, though for now, I'm mostly going to be focusing on the party members, since it actually gives them abilities that they can use in battle. Eventually, the fog does come in and nobody appears on the TV, meaning the perpetrator has been thwarted once again, and Kanji joins our party. But, that doesn't mean we're done with the TV world just yet. I go back a few days later to the TV world to grind and beat the optional bosses. Yeah, after you beat the main boss of a dungeon, you can go back a few days later and an optional boss will be there. And if you beat it, you get courage points and an item. I remember these bosses being really hard when I played this game as a kid, but I also had less experience with Megaten back then, so let's see how bad these are. Well, the boss at Yukiko's Palace certainly isn't hard, its only strong move is Rampage. And the boss of Kanji's dungeon is a little harder, it has some elemental attacks and some physical moves, and it keeps targeting Yukiko with Bufula, and it even kills her a few times, but it is also weak to electricity, so I just spam that while keeping its attack down with Tarunda, and it goes down without too many problems. A few days after that, we get access to the Motor Scooter. Now, this thing lets us drive around to unlock new places, and once we drive around three times, we get access to Okina City, which has a place called Chagall Cafe. Now, remember what I said in the beginning about being able to get skill cards from Personas? Well, in Chagall Cafe, you can spend 5,000 yen, and Walter White here will give you his special coffee, which will knock you out and give you a skill card. You know that skill card icon that's next to some skills on Personas? That's the skill card that you're going to get from your Persona if you do this. This is how I'm going to be getting skill cards from Personas. At least that's what I would be saying, but right at this moment, I realize that in order to get the skill card, you actually need to have that Persona equipped, and that would be breaking the rules. I mean, I suppose I could make an exception for this since it's not in battle, which is what matters, but at the same time, I feel like so far this challenge has been much easier than I was expecting, and... I do want to keep things interesting, and also the whole randomness factor to it all kind of makes it more fun, so for now, I think I'm going to ban the use of Chagall Cafe. However, this also makes doing most non-party social links kind of pointless. I'm still going to do them for story reasons and also Marie so I can get her dungeon, 
but I'm not going to be sweating over getting the right answers to them every time. And I'm going to prioritize party members' social links since it gets them skills and abilities that I can actually use. Anyway, after a failed attempt to pick up girls and a camping trip later, we max out Yosuke's social link, and he awakens to his ultimate persona. After that, we get back in the swing of things, and we suspect that the next victim is going to be Risei Kujikawa. A few days later, our suspicions are confirmed. So, we gather info and go to her dungeon, which is one of my favorites in this game. When we get here, it's basically the same deal as Kanji's dungeon, where the enemies are super overleveled. Though, they're still pretty easy, and most are weak to electricity. They don't actually become a challenge until about the 7th or 8th floor. Now, one thing that's cool about this dungeon is that this is where I start getting Magician Arcana cards. These are the cards that upgrade your skills. Aki becomes Muragi and Tarunda becomes Matarunda through doing this. I also get a few decent skill cards from the sword cards, like Dodge Fizz, Mahama, and Mamudo, but most of it is just ailment skills and support skills that I don't need. Eventually I make it to the end, and then I decide to grind. I take every stat boost I find in every Emperor and Magician skill card. During this time, the new skills I get are Evade Wind, Power Slash, Marakunda, and Masukunda. But, the best thing I get though, without doubt, is the Patient Collar, which contains Endure. An absolute godsend, since I can't get Endure from Shuffle Time Sword cards. After doing enough grinding, I come back the next day to challenge her. No! Don't say it! You're... not me! I'm finally myself! As for this boss, there's really not a lot to say. It has all elemental attacks, all the break skills, and Mind Slice and Spirit Drain. Just like with Shadow Kanji, it may look threatening on paper, but it's really not. It's just another damage sponge. This fight pretty much goes normally until she uses Supreme Analysis, which prevents us from hitting her. Like, at all. Yeah, you don't actually defeat this boss, because Risei accepts her shadow before we can actually beat it. But we're not done yet, because Teddy now has a shadow. And Teddy denies his shadow. I said shut up! Yeah, kinda weird that the guy who told everybody not to deny the shadow does the same thing, but then again, this is Teddy we're talking about. I shall give you the truth you claim to hold so dear. Everyone has Uno, dip. It, it came free with your fucking Xbox. Now, Shadow Teddy's fight is much more difficult than Shadow Risei. He only has ice magic attacks, but he also has some very strong physical attacks and likes to use Marakunda and Dekunda. But what really makes him threatening is that he charges up his attacks. However, this also makes him much more predictable. He usually charges before using Mabufula or Nihil Hand, so make sure you defend. He also has another attack that knocks down party members, but he rarely uses it. He also has Foolish Whisper, which silences the party, but we're going to be using mostly physical attacks anyway, so I really wouldn't worry about that. The strategy is basically to heal with Yosuke while just spamming physical attacks with everyone else. After about 20 minutes, Shadow Teddy goes down. During this next free period, I start Kanji's social link and max out Chie's social link. And thankfully in P4, I can do female character social links without actually romancing them. But this game doesn't punish you anyway, so if you want to romance them all, knock yourself out. But anyway, the fog comes in, nobody shows up on the TV, and the day is saved once again. Or so we think. The next morning, we find out that there is another victim our very own King Moron, so now we're at a standstill with the case. At least that's what I thought at first, but I guess it must not be too important because everyone seems to forget about him once Teddy shows his human form. After that, that feminine boy from earlier introduces himself as Naoto Shiragane. Risei then joins as our nav, meaning Teddy is now our new fighting party member, and then Igor explains advanced fusion to us, even though we won't be using it. The next day, Naoto comes to us, and surprise, they supposedly found the guy behind it all. But we still can't do anything, so I go back into the TV where I fight the optional boss in Risei's dungeon, and on the way there, 
Agilao becomes Miragion, and then Power Slash becomes Mighty Swing, which becomes Gigantic Fist, which then becomes Brave Blade. That's the third strongest move in the game, and I have it on the third dungeon. Talk about game-breaking mechanics. Anyway, just like all the other optional bosses, this boss isn't hard at all. Brave Blade doesn't really make the boss any less spongier, but it does do an insane amount of damage compared to everyone else. Overall, this fight is pretty easy. It just spams physical attacks with the occasional rebellion on itself. I figure if it's going to do that, there's no reason not to have Chie use Revolution, so I do that, and then Izanagi becomes an absolute critical hit machine. And Brave Blade is so strong, it actually does more damage than an all-out attack. I mean, I didn't even realize it was weak to ice until halfway through the fight. Although, some cheese does happen at the very end, though. He gets a critical hit with Rampage, kills Kanji, uses it again, kills Teddy, and then uses it again on you, which would have killed him, but thankfully he survives thanks to the patient caller, and then I'm able to finish it off with Chie's Bufula. Remember in my intro to SMT video where I said to always use Endure? I wasn't kidding, and this is a perfect example of why. But after that, not much happens. Not that I need it, I do start Dojima Social Link and max out my knowledge, meaning I now get the highest score on every exam. And after the exam, I start Rise Social Link. Then, at the end of July, we see someone on the Midnight Channel again. And after investigating, we identify the guy as Mitsuo Kubo, who is believed to be the killer. He's apparently hiding in the TV world to avoid the cops, so it's up to us to catch him. And let me just say, this is probably my favorite dungeon in the entire game. Everything from the design to the music. Now, the enemies in this dungeon aren't as overleveled as past dungeons, but either way, Brave Blade makes all these encounters a complete joke. If it doesn't kill them in one hit, it'll knock them down with a critical, and Rise also helps with all-out attacks. That's pretty much what I do for every encounter. Brave Blade and then all-out attack. While going through, I do get the skill card for Samari Karm, which is a great skill, but I don't see myself using it, so I decide to teach Izanagi Megido instead. But besides that, nothing interesting happens. I don't even think the mid-boss is worth going over because it's just a black hand that goes down super fast. By the time I reach the main boss, Izanagi is level 40 and has over 70 in strength, magic, and endurance. And this time, since the dungeon was so easy, I decide to fight Mitsuo Shadow on the same day. Now, I remember this boss being extremely difficult when I fought it as a kid, so let's see how we do now. So, the way this boss works is that he's this floating baby who hides in some kind of Minecraft pixel art. And before we can do any damage to him, we have to beat the Minecraft pixel art, and this thing takes a lot of hits. Brave Blade does around 200 to 300 against it, but even with all that damage, it still takes a while to bring him down. Once his true form is exposed, we then get a chance to do an all-out attack, but gosh dang, this true form has a ton of HP as well. But not only is he bulky, he also has all elemental magic and Megidola. But worst of all is that he has Evil Smile, the skill that gives everyone fear, which he likes to go for a lot. And he also has Ghastly Whale, which kills any enemies that are inflicted with fear. So, yeah, that's kind of a big problem. Eventually, after fighting his real form for a bit, he'll start to rebuild. And if he rebuilds fully, you'll have to fight his Minecraft form again. So it's best to start hitting him as soon as he starts rebuilding. Because that way, you knock him down faster and you can all out attack him again. So, this first fight does not go well. Like I mentioned earlier, he likes to spam fear and innervate skills, which there isn't much I can do anything about. Eventually, he starts killing my party members, and I keep trying to revive them, but before long, I run out of revival beads. After that, my party members start dropping like flies, and it comes down to a 1v1 between him and you, and then he kills me. Yeah, as much as I've been criticizing this game for being too easy, this is definitely a very difficult boss, so I'm gonna have to rethink my strategy. Thankfully, I do have a backup plan. Yukiko got Amrita from me doing her social link, but she is very underleveled, which means I'm gonna have to grind her. Thankfully, when I do grind her, we run into a lot of golden hands, which give a ton of experience, so getting her back up to level with everyone else doesn't take that long, and I give Yukiko an accessory that makes her resist fear just to be safe. 
The second attempt against the boss goes much better, even though we do get off to a pretty bad start. He starts by using Mabufula early on, which Yukiko is weak to, and then follows it up with a Megidola, which kills everyone except for you. Thankfully, I have plenty of revival beads, and after that, it's pretty easy. Brave Blade is still doing a ton of damage against him, and after repeatedly knocking him down, we're able to finish him off with a few more Brave Blades and all-out attacks. After that, we apprehend Mitsuo, and now all we can do is wait. During this period, it's more of the same. Working on social links, prioritizing the party members, of course, and during it, I maximize my social links with Nanako and Yukiko. After that, the fog comes in, Mitsuo gets apprehended, and the town is saved. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. The killer has been caught. And they all lived happily ever after. Or do they? Well, you look at how much time is left in the video and you tell me. Well, anyway, I do go back to Mitsuo's dungeon to fight the optional boss. While in there, I get another magician skill card to make Brave Blade get upgraded to God's Hand. Though, to be perfectly honest, I kinda miss Brave Blade because even though it is weaker, it does cost less and it also has a higher critical hit rate. Unfortunately, there's nothing I can do, but hopefully I'll be able to upgrade God's Hand to Primal Force later on. Anyway, the boss is really easy. It's one of those Gundam shadows and seems to be extremely weak to physical attacks because it goes down in just a few gods' hands. Anyway, the next day we go on a trip to the beach, which doesn't really have much story significance, but what it means for us is that now everyone has a scooter and we can go on road trips with them. Doing this will teach them special skills or have them remember old skills. It's especially important to do it with Risei though, because doing this with her will strengthen your all-out attacks whenever she chips in. Anyway, during this time, I maximize my social link with Kanji, and after the fireworks festival, school starts again, and we find out Naoto is now a student. A few days later, we go on a field trip to, guess where, Tatsumi Port Island from Persona 3. Again, this doesn't have much story significance, but it's some cool fan service for fans of Persona 3, and it's nice getting to see characters like Chihiro, that nurse dude, and also some of the locations like Gekukan High and Club Escapade. But what most people remember for this part is when everyone gets together in the club and gets drunk. Not off the drinks, but off the atmosphere. Yeah, I don't get it. But at least we got a Devil Summoner reference out of it. For generations now. For generations? Wow, it's like that guy from a movie I watched before. What was his name? Kuzu Noha? So anyway, once we get back to Inaba, things go back to normal again, but on a rainy night, someone shows up on the Midnight Channel again, and this time, it is none other than Naoto. But not only that, this also means that Mitsuo wasn't the killer. He was only a copycat, and the real one is still at large. So of course, this means there's another dungeon, and yeah, we're pretty underleveled. Though, to be honest, despite being underleveled, I'm actually not having that much trouble with this game because let's be real here persona 4 golden is a very easy game and i do want to keep things interesting so for now i'm not gonna grind i'm just gonna see how i continue to do while being under level but anyway this is a very cool dungeon and it's also one of the few you actually have to backtrack in you do this because in order to progress you need the leader card which is guarded by the mid boss this boss is another Gundam that likes to spam Power Charge and Herculean Strike, and has a ton of HP. It may sound difficult, but at this point in the game, Izanagi has so much endurance that we're taking those hits like they're absolutely nothing, and before long, we bring the boss down to zero health. Anyway, before I reach the end, Izanagi learns Megi Dolan from a Magician skill card, and I also get the Vicious Strike skill card, giving me a much-needed all-targeting physical attack. So... Yeah, I get to Naoto, and in her argument with her shadow, we find out that Naoto is actually a girl. Manly name. But a name doesn't change the truth. It doesn't let you cross the barrier between the sexes. How could you become an ideal man when you were never male to begin with? What? You mean the character that so many people call their waifu and flood my Twitter feed with suggestive artwork of is actually a girl? 
But yeah, jokes aside, Shadow Naoto is definitely the hardest boss so far. This thing has a wide range of attacks, including all elemental magic, Brave Blade, Tetracarn, Makarkarn, Heat Riser, Debilitate, and Mind Charge, just to name a few. And then you have her exclusive attacks, Element Zero, which cancels all your elemental resistances, Mute Ray, which deals damage to both your HP and SP and mutes you, and Galgalim Eyes, which reduces the target's HP to one and may innervate. So yeah, this is the second boss that's actually given me a good amount of trouble, though unlike most other bosses, this one doesn't really have any gimmicks. It's basically just keep attacking until it's out of HP. To me, that translates to do nothing but spam God's Hand with Izanagi. However, you can't take her on alone, and on top of all that stuff I mentioned a second ago, Shadow Naoto also hits like a freight train. Her attacks are one-shotting my party members left and right, except for you because of Izanagi's crazy high stats, but it's still a problem. It's not like I have a lot of opportunities to heal either because of how much she keeps spamming Mute Ray. You pretty much have to have Tarunda on her at all times, or else your party members will die in one hit. Once I get Tarunda up, it goes okay until she kills Yukiko. At this point, I don't have any more revival beads, so I can't revive my party members anymore. And after that, she kills Teddy, followed by Yosuke, making it come down to a 1v1 between her and you. At this point, things are looking pretty grim, especially with her Mute Ray, but she's also extremely low on health, so I decide to hold out to see if I can do it, and I can. I'm able to finish her off with a Hell Magatama. That definitely took the cake for being the hardest boss battle so far, but it did only take one attempt, so I'll take it. Anyway, I think you all know what's going to happen by now. Naoto accepts her shadow, gets her persona, and then becomes our next party member, blah blah blah. And now that Naoto's dungeon is out of the way, I don't really have much else to do. I've already maxed out everyone I need to except for Rise, and that's because she's only available on weekends. So I mostly spend these weeks taking everyone for scooter rides, but sadly 90% of these skills are completely useless. If you're doing a normal run, I really don't recommend doing any of these except for Rise's and Naoto's. During this time, I also max out Marie's social link, which unlocks her dungeon later in the game. Now, one thing that's kind of cool that I actually didn't know about until just now is that you can actually level up characters at the theater. Yeah, you can only do it once for each movie, but it's a great way to get your characters to level up if you need that little push to get them to learn that skill you need. Oh yeah, I also got my social stats maxed out. Not that I really need them anymore, but yeah, this whole break between dungeons is a pretty long one. Or at least it feels that way. There's even this pointless filler segment where we put on a concert at June S. How is it that people with no musical experience are able to put on a concert in just two days? Oh! But because I do have max social stats, I can now finish the Beef Bowl Challenge, for which my reward is... absolutely nothing! Well, finally, the game lets us go back into the TV world where there's a new optional boss, and now we have Naoto as a party member. And let me tell you, Naoto is without doubt the best party member. She has no weakness, has multiple elemental coverage, has one hit kill, and almighty attacks. Pretty much any enemies that Yu doesn't one-shot in the first turn, Naoto can easily finish off with either Hamaan or Mudun. Now, on our way to the optional boss, Izanagi learns Vorpal Blade and reaches 99 in both strength and magic. And with all the stuff we have, this optional boss is a complete joke. It's weak to wind, and now, thanks to the all-out attack bonuses with Rise, using it on bosses is now actually a viable strategy. The only time things go against our favor is at the end when it goes for Magarudine, which knocks you down and then hits him again with Garudine, which would have killed him, but doesn't thanks to our patient caller. After that, it's just a few more hits and the boss is dead. Shortly after that, I max out Risei's social link and then start Naoto's social link, our last party member social link. And it's kind of the same deal as Igus's in Persona 3, though a bit more forgiving. And it's one of the few social links that you can actually do in the rain, so that definitely helps. Oh yeah, there is also the Culture Festival, and yeah, not much story significance, just more filler. I thought this was an RPG where we were trying to catch a serial killer. Well, whatever, we watch the cross-dressing in the swimsuit contest, get our mandatory hot springs arc, because of course... 
And thankfully after that, we can finally move on with the story. As we expect, during the next rainy day, someone does appear on the Midnight Channel, but now we have no idea who. Then we get a letter from the supposed killer, and then Dojima gets on to us about the investigation and takes us to the police station, during which time, Nanako gets kidnapped. Yeah, real smart move, Dojima. So after some reasoning and a chase scene, we identify the culprit as Taru Namatame, and now it's time to go into the TV to save Nanako. And this is another pretty awesome dungeon, because it's basically a perfect representation about what a child's idea of heaven is. But yeah, thankfully I'm not as underleveled as I was in the previous dungeon, and the enemies here are especially easy because they have lots of weaknesses. Naoto can easily down almost every enemy with her coverage, and finish them off with Risei's now rank 4 all-out attack, which is pretty much an instant kill whenever we get it. It also helps that I can easily see their weaknesses with Risei's scanning ability. During this time, Izanagi's endurance and luck both get maxed, leaving me with only agility left. Now, as for skill cards, this is when we start being able to get some really useful moves. However, I'm still getting extremely unlucky with them, and I also can't rank up any more of Izanagi's skills with the Magician, meaning that I'm pretty much stuck with God's Hand unless I find a skill card for Primal Force, which I don't seem to get. Now, the mid-boss here, as expected, is extremely easy. It has no weakness, but dies after two or three God's Hands. Before long, we get to Namatame, and now we have to fight his shadow. But this isn't just Namatame's shadow. This is Kunino Sagiri, the Japanese god of fog. The best way to describe Kunino Sagiri as a boss is basically Naoto on steroids. Just like Naoto, Kunino Sagiri has all elemental magic, all the break skills, and unnerving justice, which is a heavy almighty attack. And just like Naoto, he's really freaking strong, able to easily one-shot my party members without debuff, so make sure you either debuff his attack or buff your defense at all times. But unlike Naoto, this boss actually does have a gimmick. He has this thing where he can take control of a party member, even though he only does this once in this entire fight, and he also has a thing where he can change the effectiveness of certain elements while lowering all the others. This may sound bad, but it doesn't affect physical attacks or almighty attacks, which is pretty much everything I'm using anyway. The strategy for this boss is pretty much the same as it was for Naoto. God's Hand with you, heal with Yukiko, buff with Teddy, and do whatever with Naoto, usually that being Megidola. Nothing really all that interesting happens in this fight. I do underestimate how strong he is at the beginning, so some party members go down, but I'm able to quickly revive them after that, and after that, it's pretty much a cakewalk. A very long and spongy cakewalk, but still a cakewalk. We save Nanako, and once again, all there is to do is wait. I take this remaining time to max out Naoto's social link, but after that, there's really nothing else to do. No, really, there's almost nothing left for me to do in this game besides wait for the next dungeon to be available. I mean, I can do stuff like level up in the theater and go on bike rides and stuff, but I don't have any more social links, or, well, I do, but there's no reason to, and there's almost nothing to do at night either. Because there's pretty much nothing to do, I decide to work on social links even though it doesn't really matter and I'm probably not going to be able to finish them, and then eventually the fog does come in. Dojima and Nanako wake up, but Namatame can't talk, so we can't get full closure on the case just yet. On top of that, the fog won't die down, which is causing everyone to panic. I actually really love this part, because it gives you this eerie and ominous feeling, which is helped even more with the lack of music. Though, there's still nothing else we can do but wait, and by wait, I mean grind and fight the optional boss in Nanako's dungeon. On the way to the boss in Nanako's dungeon, I max out Izanagi's agility, so he is now fully maxed out in all stats. But, unfortunately, I still get garbage skill cards. Well, not total garbage, I do get Regenerate 3, which is the best alternative to Arms Master, which I don't have access to, and Mind Charge, which might help later. But what I really need is Resist Wind. You can get this from level 5 sword cards, which are extremely common in this dungeon, however, I seem to get everything from these cards except for that. Oh yeah, and I should also mention that once Risei reaches level 61, she learns Relaxing Wave, which heals our SP by 5% after every battle. 
Because of this, it's pretty much impossible for you to run out of SP. I have like 90% of my max SP by the time I reach the boss. And as expected, it's really easy. The only difficult thing about it is that it nulls physical, but it doesn't really seem to matter because it has pretty brain dead AI and no real strong moves. I just buff with Teddy, spam strong magic, and it goes down pretty quickly. But going back to the story, we later find out that the glasses we got from the TV world actually work on the fog in the real world. We then get a call from Adachi saying that Nanako's condition is getting worse. We then hurry back to the hospital, and once we get there, we also find out that Namatame can't be tried because of his method of throwing people into the TV. But then, something happens. Nanako's condition takes a turn for the worse, and, well... Nanako! <clears throat> I'm sorry, sir. <gasps> yeah, I already knew about what happened, and as much as I criticize this game for its storytelling, this scene still really does get to me. It's rare in a video game or a movie for a child to die, but in this case, Atlas did an excellent job of handling this. But now, it's time to confront Namatame, and this part is very easy to mess up. If you make one wrong choice here, you'll be locked into the bad ending. Just tell Yosuke that you don't have the right evidence, and you'll be good. Once everyone calms down, that maxes out the full social link, and then starts the judgment social link. And then, we step outside to discuss what we know. And then, guess what? Nanako is alive! Oh, and also Teddy is missing. Okay, I gotta ask, why did they have to ruin this part with this stupid subplot where Teddy goes missing? It just takes so much of the impact away, but I guess it's at least done better than when Morgana ran off in Persona 5. So anyway, we meet up the next day and discuss our evidence and decide to confront Namatame again. After hearing his story, we conclude that he is not the killer. After doing some investigating, we meet up at the diner to discuss what we know. And after analyzing the evidence, we conclude that the killer is... Nanako. Nah, just kidding, it's Toru Adachi. We confront him, he blows his cover, and now it's time to go after him. Oh yeah, that same night I also see Teddy in the Velvet Room and I max out my social link with him. And then he sadly comes back. But at least it finally puts an end to this stupid storyline about Teddy disappearing. And also his new persona is pretty good, so that's a plus. But yeah, we go into the TV, find Adachi, learn how he became the killer, and then get to his dungeon. Magatsu Inaba and Magatsu Mandala. Depending on which ending you plan to do, this may or may not be the final dungeon. But anyway, at this point, I've pretty much decided that my final team will be Teddy, Yukiko, and Naoto. I should also mention that this dungeon has a gimmick as well, and probably my favorite one in the game. It involves you going through portals to reach the spot you need to go to progress on each floor. The enemies here are a complete joke. Naoto can pretty much steamroll through them all, and they don't put up any kind of a challenge. I do decide to swap Maziongo with Moragidine, but then with Mind Charge since I have Megidol on, and I'm glad I decided to do this because Mind Charge gives me just the power I need to defeat most of the Golden Hands. But now most of you are probably wondering what happens in this dungeon. Well, get this. Close to the end of the dungeon, I get the biggest stroke of luck ever. I get the Rebirth Prophecy, which is the accessory that gives me Enduring Soul, but I also finally get the skill card for Resist Wind. We finally did it, everyone. We're close to the end of the game, but we finally have a weakness-free Izanagi. Oh, but my luck doesn't stop there. Immediately after that, I get Firm Stance, which is a skill that halves all the damage you take, but prevents you from dodging, which may sound like a bad deal, especially with the existence of skills like Hama and Mudo, 
But keep in mind that it only prevents you from dodging. It doesn't prevent the enemy from missing. So if you ask me, sacrificing your ability to dodge while having all damage is more than worth it in my opinion. But yeah, I'm also able to upgrade my resist wind to null wind with magician skill cards, but for some reason I can't upgrade it to drain or repel. But then again, as long as my weakness is covered, I'm not going to complain. Now, getting back to the dungeon, I get to Adachi and he gives a society speech and then we fight him. Now, Adachi is without doubt the spongiest boss so far. Even with our buffs and debuffs, our attacks are barely putting a dent in his health. He also has Heat Riser, which is annoying, but for the most part, this fight is pretty easy. He doesn't have any exclusive moves, and the moves that he does have barely put a scratch on any of our party members. He basically just spams Magaru Dine and Vorpal Blade, neither of which are doing anything. Still though, Adachi is just bulky as heck. He can eat up my god's hands like they're nothing. Also, for some reason, magic seems to be much more effective here, despite him not resisting physical and God's Hand having a much higher base power than pretty much any magic attack in the entire game. I don't know the way damage works in Persona 4, but it's just really weird. Sometimes attacks do a lot, other times they do almost nothing. But either way, for this fight, magic is much more effective than physical attacks. Well, the fight goes on for a while, but eventually we do defeat Adachi, but we're not done yet. Once we defeat Adachi, we find out that the source of the fog was Amino Sagiri. Like most Mega Ten games, he gives you some exposition about the will of mankind, and we basically tell him, up yours, and then he turns into a giant eyeball, and now we gotta fight him. So, Amino Sagiri is very similar to Kunino Sagiri. All elemental magic, some almighty attacks, some exclusive attacks, but he doesn't have any of the break skills, though he does have buffs, which is pretty annoying. And as you would expect, he has a crap ton of HP. Though he doesn't seem to be hitting as heavy as Kunino Sagiri. His attacks do absolute diddly squat to you thanks to Firm Stance. However, it does do a decent amount to the rest of the party, but not enough to kill us easily. One thing that's pretty annoying is his Quake Attack, which has a chance to knock us all down when it hits, and he also has Bewildering Fog, which prevents us from hitting him when it's active. Combine this with the aforementioned high HP, and you're in for a pretty long battle. And if I die on this difficulty, I'll have to fight Adachi again, so I gotta make double sure that I don't screw this up. The battle strategy is pretty much the same as the last few bosses. Just keep his attack down at all times, heal with Yukiko, buff with Teddy, and attack with you and Naoto. I just keep this up, and there's not much he can do to me. He does start spamming Dekunda every turn toward the end, but again, I just keep hitting him with debuffs over and over. And yeah, 20 or 30 minutes later, he goes down. We did it everybody, we caught the killer, the fog clears up, we max the judgment social link, and the day is saved, and they all lived happily ever after. Or do they? Well, you're about to find out, but what you need to know is that right now it's back to just doing normal stuff. It's almost like the game's not over. Once again, we return to the Velvet Room, and then we see that Marie is no longer there. She's apparently gone missing, and now Margaret is looking for her. But again, all we can do is wait, because we also find out that we are sick, which puts us into a coma, where we see visions of Marie. Now, after you wake up, things go back to normal, but again, there's not much to do. One thing you can do during this time is talk to the characters, and their personas will evolve again, and they learn new skills. They're pretty good, but honestly, some of them are way too costly in my opinion. For example, Naoto's Shield of Justice cost 160 SP. Like, dang. But doing it does give them better resistances, so I'd say that alone makes it worth doing it for every character. So I do this with everyone, and now there's actually another optional boss I get to fight. One that I completely forgot about in my Persona 3 video, and that boss is the Reaper. In Persona 3, the Reaper existed as kind of a way to prevent players from staying on a floor for too long, or as a sort of punishment for drawing cursed cards. If you get into a fight with him early in the game, you're pretty much dead. 
Now, the Reaper does exist in Persona 4, but here he's more of a secret boss. It's pretty much impossible to encounter him without trying. In fact, if we were playing the vanilla version, we wouldn't be able to encounter him at all unless we were playing on New Game Plus. What you have to do is you have to open 21 chests, after which you'll start hearing chains rattling, which means a random chest on that floor contains the Reaper. If you're not ready, this can easily be avoided by just going to a different floor, and even if you do try to open a chest that contains him, you'll get a warning. But for those of us that are ready, we're just going to ignore the warning and let the fight begin. So, in Persona 4, the Reaper basically functions identically to the way he does in Persona 3. He usually likes to spend his turns going for the break skills and just spamming random elemental magic stacks with the occasional Megidolon or Mind Charge. He also has Mahama on and Mamu Dune, but he doesn't seem to go for them that much. He does have a lot of HP, but nowhere near as much as Amino Sagiri, but he does have some pretty strong offensive stats. As usual, make sure you keep his attack down and your defense up, otherwise he will obliterate you. However, one thing that's kind of annoying about him is that just like Nyx in Persona 3, because he has two turns, debuffs on him only last half as long, so if you want to keep his attack down, you have to pretty much spam Tarun to every turn. It's bullcrap, but if you want to live, you're going to have to do it. Other than that, I think you all know the drill by now. Yukiko to heal, buff with Teddy, attack with you and Naoto. Nothing really interesting happens in this fight. It pretty much goes according to plan. He does knock down Yukiko once, but this isn't much of a problem. I also get a lucky critical hit toward the end, and after that, it's just a few more hits and the Reaper goes down. Yes, we won! Congrats, guys! Now, defeating the Reaper will give you the ultimate weapon for one of your party members that participated in that battle. Because I don't have any of them, it gives me the Blade of Totsuka, which is Yu's best weapon. If you want, you can keep farming him to get all the ultimate weapons, after which he'll start giving you the ultimate armors, and if you defeat him once you have all those, you'll get the Omnipotence Orb, which nulls all attacks except Almighty. Honestly, this fight wasn't that hard, so I suppose I could do that, but it would also take an insanely long time, and I'm almost done with this game anyway. I really just wanted to get that fight to cross another boss off the list, so I'm gonna take what I got for now. But, I mean, for now, there's really nothing to do. After two weeks of just going to the movies, bike riding, and reading my remaining books, we go on a ski trip, and I know what you're all thinking. Another filler segment? Well, unlike most of the vacations or field trips or whatever in Persona 4, this one actually does play a part in the plot. On the last day, you and whoever you decide to go skiing with, in this case the guys, all get stranded in an old cottage due to a blizzard. An old TV turns on and everyone else shows up and then they all fall into the TV. Yeah, how did they all fit inside that thing? So we get to this place and oh hey, it's Margaret. She explains that this is where Marie is hiding. So yeah, this place is the Hollow Forest. It's the optional dungeon that you get for completing Marie's social link. Now, unlike the others, this dungeon has to be completed in one sitting, and it's also the most gimmicky dungeon in the entire game. The first thing you'll notice is that it takes away all of your items, including your equipment. And the next thing you'll notice is that on certain floors, including the first one, there aren't any shadows crawling around. To get around in this dungeon, you have to cut these ropes. Doing this has a chance to send you into battle with a shadow, but most important of all is that your SP is halved after every battle. The idea of this dungeon is that throughout it you'll find equipment and armor that you'll only have access to in this dungeon. Some of it voids your weaknesses and some of it will restore your SP every turn. So you gotta have to use what the game gives you in order to scrape up as much SP as you can to fight the enemies. I know there are a lot of people that don't like this dungeon and personally I'm a little mixed on it. On one hand I really like the idea of the game taking away your stuff and forcing you to come up with a new strategy on the spot. But at the same time, not only are the enemies here really weak, they also give you almost no EXP and zero money, so unless you get into a fight with them from opening a chest or cutting a rope, you're better off just running past them. The mid-boss, though, is freaking awesome. It's the Tokyo Sky Tree. No, I'm serious, look at it, what else could it be? But it's also actually kind of challenging. This is one of the few mid-bosses that actually puts up a decent fight. It nulls everything in the game except for physical and almighty, which it resists and is also decently strong. 
I wouldn't say it's hard though. Despite it resisting it, God's Hand still does a ton of damage, and I get a lucky critical in the beginning where I follow it up with an all-out attack for some massive damage, which gets rid of most of its HP, and not long after that, it goes down. After that, I make it to Marie pretty quickly, because thankfully this dungeon is pretty short and straightforward. Once there, Marie explains that she is Izanami no Mikoto, and that she carries the fog, meaning that she has to die or else the world will disappear. And now, we have to fight her. So, Marie may not seem so bad at first. Her moves aren't terribly strong. Her most used move is Hot Lightning, which is an electric attack that may inflict Dizzy. She also has Megidolon and Mind Charge, but she doesn't go for these as often. However, she also reflects all physical attacks, so forget about using God's Hand. Overall, this fight isn't too terribly hard, but you're limited to only using magic. However, once you knock away a good third of her health, she'll cast Shield of Denial, which makes her reflect everything, so don't even try, just guard. A few turns after she uses this, she'll go into her second form, Kusumi no Okami, and this is where things start to get tricky. Kusumi no Okami reflects everything in the game except for Almighty. This may sound horrible, but while running around the Hall of Force, you should have gotten some items that let you use the break skills, and if you still have any of the break skills, you should be fine. On top of this, every time she uses Bewildering Fog, she'll do 250 damage to herself. As far as her other moves go, she has all elemental magic, but hopefully you got the element resisting armor from the Hall of Forest. If you did, this won't be too much of a problem. She also has a move called Run Amuck, which is an almighty attack that hits everyone. Overall, it's not too problematic, but once you do a good amount of damage to her, she'll start going for Hot Lightning again, which makes things much more frustrating. Her most annoying moves, though, are Enclosure Shell, which temporarily nulls all attacks, and Cry of Denial, which removes debuffs and inflicts mute on the party. The best way to describe this fight is that you basically have to be very smart about it. If you're not, it'll be the worst fight ever, but if you know what you're doing, it's really not that bad. You just have to make good use of your element breaking items and your limited SP. What I do is I use the breaker items, spam whatever element that breaks until it wears off, and rinse and repeat. Because of her attacks, she will be inflicting a lot of ailments, but Yukiko can easily cure them. Thankfully, this boss also doesn't have great defense, so our attacks are doing a pretty good amount of damage, and before long, and after a lot of stalling and a lot of items, we finally bring Kusumi no Okami down. The fog is officially gone for good, and we have officially saved Marie. So now what do we do? Well, go to the hot spring, of course, where, of course, Teddy and Yosuke try to peep and knock over the wall. Because, of course. And then Marie gets pissed and zaps us. I hate you all! Welcome back and then we go back home. You seems pretty okay for just getting hit with a giant bolt of lightning. But after that, well, that's just about it. This game automatically skips ahead to March 31st, which is the day before the day you is supposed to go back home. We mostly spend this day walking around and saying goodbye to our social link characters, and then the game will ask us if we want to leave. Most people that played this game for the first time probably just said yes without giving it a second thought. But what happens if you say no? This is what you have to do if you want to get the true ending, and it is extremely easy to miss. I'm sure most people that played this game back in 2008 missed it without even realizing it. After this, you have to go to Juness where you'll have dinner with everyone, and then you'll get a letter from Adachi. After reading it, they'll all be wondering what the source of everything is, and then the gang will ask you to find the first person you made physical contact with in Inaba. But who was it? Was it Dojima? Was it Nanako? No. It was that gas station attendant, remember? So you talk to her, and keep pestering her for more information, and then she'll eventually reveal who she really is. The one behind everything. Izanami. And now, we've locked ourselves into the true ending. 
This is it, everybody. This is the final dungeon. We have one day to do this last dungeon in one run. Now, as you would expect for the last dungeon, this game is starting to throw some really strong enemies at us, but with everything we've got, it's really no big deal. There are also two mid-bosses, the Neo Minotaur, which spams Rampage, and the infamous Sleeping Table, which spams Megidolon. Neither of these bosses are hard and go down pretty quickly. And there are also no gimmicks to this dungeon either. You just head to the top and reach Izanami, which doesn't take long. This is it, guys. The final battle. But before we fight Izanami, let's take one last look at our Izanagi. Level 91, with 99 in all stats, with Mind Charge, God's Hand, Vorpal Blade, Apt Pupil, Null Wind, Regenerate 3, Megidolon, and Firm Stance. We then go through the door, and after some dialogue, the battle begins. Now, let's talk about Izanami's boss battle, though I think you all know what to expect of late game bosses by this point. All elemental attacks, check. Megidolon, check. Mind Charge, check. Ailment attacks, check. Though, oddly enough, she doesn't have any exclusive special moves. It basically works like the last several bosses we've already fought, though Izanagi especially seems to have some crazy high endurance. I lead off with God's Hand, which only does around 90 damage, and then I follow it up with a Megidolon, which only does 80. So, the next turn, after buffing my attack, I have Naoto use Agidine, and it only does 100 damage. The only way I can do a decent amount is with Mind Charge. Thankfully, this boss doesn't have a huge amount of HP, but with defenses like these, it's going to be a while before we bring her down, especially when we have to heal every turn and make sure our buffs are constantly up. Oh yeah, and as you'd expect, without her attack debuffed, she can easily kill most of your party members in one hit. That being said, overall this fight pretty much goes the way I want it to. I do get a few unlucky misses, but none of the party members go down during this fight at all. Once you get Izanami to 0 HP, she'll then become impervious. This is another one of those story-based sequences, so just guard with everyone except for you, and then you'll hear Igor and Margaret's voices in your head. You'll use the Orb of Sight, and Izanami will now be defeated. But if you think we're done, well, you must be new to the JRPG genre. Like pretty much every JRPG boss in history, Izanami has a second form, Izanami no Okami. And holy crap, talk about a weird design. Oh, and also, you're not healed after she transforms, so make sure you either save your SP or have plenty of SP restoring items. Now, Izanami no Okami deals about the same amount of damage she did in her first form. However, she now actually does have several more attacks, including exclusive attacks. Her favorite one seems to be Fury of Yasugami, which is a heavy almighty attack. Her strategy, pretty much every turn, seems to be using an elemental magic attack, and then following it up with a Fury of Yasugami. But she does have some other strategies too, like sometimes she'll go for a Power Charge followed by Agni Astra, sometimes she'll use Kuro Ikazuchi, which is another almighty move, and occasionally use Masukunda, Matarunda, or Debilitate. Once you get her low enough, she'll then start using ailment moves, like Galgalim Eyes and World's End, a heavy almighty attack that inflicts a random ailment. Now, these by themselves aren't a problem, but pretty much every time she'll follow this up with a summons to Yomi, which actually kills all party members suffering from ailments. Thankfully, she usually goes for Mind Charge before using World's End, so as long as you guard, you won't have to worry about the ailments. Overall, I wouldn't call this fight hard. I'd say it's comparable to the Isamu fight in SMT Nocturne. Not really difficult, just very long and tedious. It's one of those bosses that takes forever to beat, but you can do it if you know what you're doing, but you can't get impatient, because if you do, you're probably gonna die. In fact, something like that actually did almost happen close to the end of the fight, where I got careless and forgot to guard with you after she mind charged, causing him to get poisoned by World's End, which she then would have killed him with a summons to Yomi, but you is revived thanks to the Rebirth Prophecy. Thankfully, by the time this happened, she was already pretty low, and it didn't take me long to finish her off after that. But don't think that once she's at 0 HP, the fight is over. It goes into a scripted sequence where Izanami won't take any more damage, and will cast Thousand Curses on your entire party until she gets to you. Once she gets to us, we get some motivation for our friends, get back up, 
and cast myriad truths. And that concludes the fight with Izanami. This time for good. The next day, we meet everyone at the train station, say our goodbyes, get on the train back home, and that is the end of Persona 4. Epilogue. Yeah, in Golden, there's this epilogue where you return to Inaba a year later and get to see all the characters with their different clothes and haircuts, and yeah, that's about it. It's good to see you, senpai! Kanji, it was welcome back. How could you mess that up? Hey, just shut up, all right? I just got stage fright, that's well, all. Well, I figured someone would blow it. <laughs> After that, the credits roll, and that concludes Persona 4. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. It is more than possible to beat Persona 4 Golden using only Izanagi. Now, I already know what some of you are thinking. You're probably going to tell me that this was hardly a challenge because how much the mechanics of Persona 4 Golden break the game and make it way too easy. And for those of you, you're right. This challenge was extremely easy. Not to say it wasn't fun though, I did have a lot of fun playing this game relying on only one Persona, and it also gave me an excuse to play Persona 4 again. I know I give this game a lot of criticism in this video, but despite some pretty glaring flaws, I do think Persona 4 is a great game, and it does have a lot of nostalgic value for me as well. Now, I'm sure a bunch of people are already wondering what my next challenge video will be, and... To be perfectly honest with you guys, I think I'm going to be taking a break from challenge runs for a while. I'm still going to be doing my Devil Survivor 2 No Fusion streams on my second channel, but it's going to be a while before I do another video of a Mega 10 challenge. I want to get my other planned non-challenge videos out of the way before I start doing challenge videos again. As always, I want to give a big thank you to my Ko-Fi supporters, and be sure to rate, comment, and or subscribe if you haven't already. Until the next video, I will see you all later. This is Niarly, and you have entered eternal punishment. One kingdom under us. <laughs> Just give up, kid. No such thing as innocent sin, no. and I know because I've committed many. Yeah. Corrupt my violence into extreme melodies, my own mind, I keep me a blink. Yeah. I bring my piece to the diner, we can get busy, make yeah. up once again. Oh. I swear this underground scene really nothing but gossip and rumors, it's I'm real city. You have forgotten me, I have been tied to another world that has already been lost. To our side by our memories, as you remember me, everything you love is gone. Once I dimensional, I got it sold to the heavens above, once the clock fill them on. In this world, you can get killed by ideals, but it's really no secret, I die for my cause.